So thank you so much, uh, Rob, for joining us today. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, I've chatted with you last um, in Manchester during a workshop um, there on the imagination. And um, you told me that you were writing a book on the imagination and that um, got me quite curious about it. Uh, and for this, um, series of interview uh, with the Northern Imagination Forum, we've decided to interview philosophers uh, that uh, are working on the imagination and related topics about their work in progress concerning uh, up-to-date uh, research that might be of interest to members uh, watching this interview uh, at home. Um, so today we have Rob Hopkins. Um, I'm just going to introduce Rob. Uh, really quickly. So um, Rob uh, was actually linked to the University of Sheffield previously uh, when uh, where this um, Northern Imagination Forum project has been started. So we thought Rob would be a great person to be our first interviewee. Uh, and currently Rob um, is a professor at NYU. Uh, he has been honorary secretary of the Mind Association president of the European Society for Aesthetics and is currently a trustee on the American Society for Aesthetics. Um, he uh, has been interested for a long time uh, in the philosophy of mind and in aesthetics and has been writing a book, as I was just saying, on the sensory imagination. So Rob, I was wondering if you could just introduce the book that you uh, are writing in just a couple of minutes and tell us a little bit more about the different themes that you are planning on addressing in this book. Sure, thanks, Deb. So the book is about sensory imagining. It's not really about imagining as a whole. And I'm in particularly interested in the differences between sensory imagining and perceiving, not just their intrinsic phenomenological differences, though they're very important to me, but the different ways they plug into our mental economies. So I see myself as belonging to a tradition that is now somewhat neglected, a tradition whose great figures are Sartre, Gilbert Ryle and Wittgenstein. And it's set against a tradition which is orthodoxy that stems back to Hume. The Humean tradition thinks that basically imagining and perceiving are, uh, it tries to understand them by their similarities. The tradition I'm trying to revive contrasts on the differences, concentrates on the differences. So to that end, the book will discuss various themes. I will unfortunately for me, and perhaps for my poor readers, have to offer something of a partial theory of perceiving in order to provide a foil against which to set imagining. But most of the book will be about imagining and how the resources I've tried to trace in the context of perception are applied very differently there. So some themes I'll talk about are uh, the following, that uh, both perceiving and knowing involve sensory, sorry, both perceiving and imagining involve sensory knowledge. That's to say they involve ordering sensory input via something that counts in some loose sense as knowing, but that the, those resources are put to very different effect in the two contexts with a very different upshot. That in a way is the heart of the theory of the book, though I don't think it's what we're going to concentrate on today. Uh, downwind from that, I want to explore such themes as our knowledge of our own imaginings, about which I'm not very optimistic. I think essentially, if it's there, we know about it in some sense of no. And uh, the knowledge we can gain from imagining, which may be our topic today. That's up to you, I suppose, Deb. Mm -hmm. And I also want to talk about, uh, in the book, about the role of sensory imagining in memory, particularly experiential memory which essentially I think just is imagining, sensory imagining put to a specific use. And towards the end of the book, I hope to talk about the role of imagining in aesthetic and affective engagement. But all the way through, I'll be trying to argue that it's only too easy to assimilate sensory imagining to perceiving, to think of it as playing loosely similar functional roles in relation to things like emotion and memory and then, in fact, its its role is very different. I'll be looking for differences wherever I can find them. Great. Yes, I had a little snapshot of that, and that was really interesting. There's a vast area of 
there, there is a really vast area of topics that you're covering in the book and it, it's really quite an exciting project. So I really look forward to reading more of it. Um, so I had a look at a chapter of the book on indeed imagination um, and knowledge. So yes, indeed today we'll, we'll ask you a couple of questions about that. But before that, um, we're an informal forum. So I wanted to ask you about um, what got you thinking about the imagination? What, why you thought initially that that was an interesting topic of research? Well, my early work was, and some of my current work still is, on pictures, external pictures. And uh, since I think the way to understand pictures theoretically is through the experiences they generate, what are sometimes called seeings in, so we see a cat in a picture, say, uh, and since that is a kind of visual presentation of a cat in this case, but it's very different from the visual presentation you get if you see a cat face to face, it's fairly natural, at least it was natural for me anyway, to complete the triad by turning to the other prominent kind of visual presentation one might have of a cat or anything else, i.e. visualizing one. So I've always thought, and I say this towards the end of the the book I published on pictures, that there is a kind of a space for a kind of conceptual trigonometry, understanding each of these three states by their relation to and differences from the others. And in a way, trying to get clear about visual imagining completes that exercise. But of course, in the book, I'll be interested in sensory imagining across the modalities. And ideally, I'd like what I say to apply beyond sensory imagining to what we might think of as experiential imagining more broadly. That might include imagining affects, imagining bodily sensations, that kind of thing. So. Good. Can you tell us a little bit more about the difference between sensory imagining and experiential imagining that you just mentioned for people that might not be aware of it? Well, the rough idea is, and this isn't my idea, it goes back at least to someone like Peacock in his famous paper on this topic, is that uh, sensory imagining is a subset of experiential imagining. So it's very tempting for almost everybody, I think, to think that you can visualize a castle, say, and that doing so is in some ways, you might disagree about how much, it's different from seeing a castle. Uh, and if you can do it in the visual mode, you can probably do it in the auditory mode, imagine the tune in your head, you can probably do it in the olfactory or gustatory mode, the tactual mode. So the sensory imaginings roam across the modalities, but they are not, the full extent of the imaginings that are somewhat experience-like in quality, to use the kind of loose talk one's forced to here. So without going all the way out to imaginings that aren't at all like this, imaginings that are purely propositional, for instance, when you imagine you're descended from a pirate, to borrow another example from Peacock, mm -hmm. without going that far out, we get beyond the sensory, but we're still in the experiential. So some people now get a bit skeptical about this, but it seems to me pretty clear you can imagine having a toothache, not just imagining that you've got a toothache, but imagine what it feels like. And that isn't to use any of the normal five senses. And I think you can imagine feeling angry, imagine being in various kinds of pain, various kinds of bodily disturbance, tingles, etc. All these things can be imagined without necessarily having to have them. So there's another category another kind of set of states that aren't the experiences, they are the experiential imaginings. That's the idea. Great. Um, so you've talked about a few different kinds of imaginings, um, sensory imaginings, experiential imaginings, propositional imaginings. Do you think um, that they are connected in an important way? Can you tell us a little bit more about what is imagination in your view? I don't really have a theory of that. What I have is a very much a fragment of a theory. So uh, when it comes to the sensory imaginings, what I think is that we um, take something like the knowledge we use to order perceptions. So for instance, the knowledge you have of the way this thing over here would look if you were to view it from the other side, given that you see it as a cube, right? that kind of knowledge. So you're seeing it, but you're not just seeing it as a facade, you see it as a cube. That involves something that we might think of as knowledge of what it will look like from the other side. That kind of knowledge is deployed in imagining too, I think. Mm -hmm. But it's deployed in a very different way. In perception, you have an expectation about how the thing will look from the other side. 
There are no expectations of that kind anyway in imagining. As Sartre said, if you were to rotate the visualized cube in your head, you'd be wasting your time if you did it in order to find out what the other side was like. If it's already a certain way, you already know what it's like. So we can't be dealing with expectations. Instead, we're dealing with something that I think of as commitments. Mm -hmm. You undertake, given that you're doing this now, to do that then, and that's how you manage to visualize a cube. And these commitments are somewhat like the kind of commitments you undertake when you tell a story. So if you begin a story, once upon a time there was a frog, you're gonna have to deal with the frog as you go on. The frog may turn out to have been a prince all along, but there still was a frog that at one point was a prince. You can't just get rid of the frog without incoherence and somewhat analogously in sensory imagining. So there is an important connection between sensory imagining as I'm thinking of it and another phenomenon that is pretty clearly imaginative. And that's to say the phenomenon of telling a story. So something like that is the very fragmentary theory I have of what links these things together. And if pushed further, I would try and tie everything else that we consider to be imaginative uh, up with that same thread, but I'm not saying that would be easy. Good, that's, that's really informative. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what it means to commit um, to, to a particular aspect and how that's different from expectations? So you mentioned that difference and I, I read the, um, the detailed sort of summary of, of how that's playing a role in, in the chapter, but I'm wondering if that might be a little bit unclear to some of the people who don't have that background knowledge. Sure. Well, I, commitment is in a way a term of art, and to some extent the notion is brute for me. But it's um, one way to think of it is by analogy with a storytelling case. So if I start a story in a certain way, I'm laying out how things will have to go if I'm to keep telling my story. Nothing forces me to, of course. I can stop telling the story. I can start telling a different story, or I can, in Borgesian mode, just tell a very, very strange, incoherent story. Mm -hmm. But there's something, it's not really a norm in the imaginative case, but there's something that we, for now, we just think of as a norm of storytelling that sets, commits me to carrying on in the same way. And something like that is going on when I visualize a cube. I bring to mind one of its facets, but if it's to be a cube and not just a cube facade, then I need to do more than that. And my thought is that what I do is undertake commitments, something like the sort of promises I make to myself when I tell a story to carry on in a certain way if I were to imagine a thing rotating. Something like that is probably all I can usefully say for now, I think. Right, that's that's really good. That's a really yeah nice analogy. Uh, and I think it, it drives the point a little bit um, further home. So um, you've mentioned um, that imagination and perceptions are related, but fairly different and they differ in their phenomenology in important ways. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you've already mentioned a couple of things um, so far, um, but, but in the book, you, you'll obviously unpack that a little bit more. What are key differences that you think um, people should be aware of? Well, there's really, they really fall into two main categories. One stems from the difference between expectations and commitments. So they have upshots, I think, for one's epistemic relations to one's own states. It's not possible, as, as the example from Sartre suggests, to find out that what I was imagining was a cube, or is it certainly possible to find out that what I thought to be a cube I was seeing is in fact not one? That's one major strand of differences. But the knowledge I've talked about, knowledge of how cubes look differently from different angles, that's only part of what's going on in imagining. It's got to be applied to something if it's to yield a phenomenologically rich state. So just stepping back a bit here, my inspiration here in a way is partly something that Ryle says. So Ryle says, and here he leans on a distinction from Kant, that sensing, perceiving the world, involves sensation, sensory input we might say, and a kind of ordering of it under concepts or something like that maybe not concepts, but some kind of rules. Ryle says that Hume and his ilk think that imagining is the sensory bit reproduced. He thinks they're completely wrong. 
It's the knowing bit redeployed. As he puts it, there is nothing like sensation, by which I think he means anything that was like sensation, as on Hume's view imagining would be, would just be a different kind of sensation. I think that's what he means by that. Now I'm with Ryle on the thought that the knowing is very important, but I'm not with him on the thought that it is all important. In the end, brilliant as Ryle's theory is, I think it fails because it won't give any role for anything sensation-like in his theory of imagining. So I have to make a major concession to the Humeans if my theory is to be any good, and that is to accept there is something sensation-like involved in imagining. And that is, the, the, if you like, the input on which the knowledge operates in the imaginative case. But it is, although it structurally plays the same role as sensory input in the case of perception, it is very different. And it's something I call conjuring. So as I put it, when you see a cube, you are presented with, let's just call it for now, the facet, and you see it as a cube by placing that facet in a certain sensory profile. You have expectations about how the thing will look from other angles. When you imagine a cube, you're not presented with a facet, you conjure one, but you then go on to do much the same thing by undertaking commitments with respect to the other conjurings you could go in for were you to imagine the thing from other angles. So what is conjuring? This is by way of answering to your question. Conjuring differs from uh, being presented with things in important ways, and this is the other core difference between the imaginative and the perceptual. So, Presentation, and indeed the whole of perceiving, I think, has the phenomenology that you'd expect it to have if direct realism were true. Now, that is not to say that direct realism is true. Mm -hmm. It's to say the phenomenology is as if it were true. Mm -hmm. So unpacking that a bit, when you perceive things, I think, your mental state, the way things are with you, is given to you as constituted by the way things are with the world constituted by it, not caused by it, not accurately representing it, but constituted by it. So when I see the room around me, my mental state presents the way things are with me as made up of, in key part, the way things are in the room. Mm. That relationship is so tight, it is too tight to be representation. Right? That is why direct realists are not representationalists. And so if the phenomenology is as if Direct realism is true. The phenomenology is not as if representationalism is true, I think. Um, so perceptions are not given to us as representations. They may be representations, but that's not how they seem. Imaginings, in contrast, are the paradigmatic states given to us as representations. And this starts with the conjuring that is at their core. So when I conjure the facet of a cube, it doesn't seem to me as if I'm in a state constituted by how anything else is. It seems to me rather that my state just represents things as being a certain way. There's a clear gap between how things are with me and how things may be anywhere in the world. So that is the other big difference between perceiving and imagining. So the two differences are in virtue of conjuring versus being presented with, imagining is manifestly representational, perceiving is apparently not representational. And in virtue of the difference between commitments and expectations, imagining involves all sorts of undertaking to do things and, and guaranteed knowledge of how things are in the imagined world and perceiving does not. Good, yes, that's really informative. I really liked the distinction that you made in the chapter about um, between awareness and belief. And I think that's something that readers can uh, look forward to once the book um, comes out. I wanted to ask you just one more little question on, on what you've just said about the relationship between imagination and perception. Um, and that is, if they are indeed so different in, in many respects, what explains um, that there are similarities in the phenomenology of perception and imagination? Are we wrong to think that, that there are similarities in how they feel? Or is, is that uh, explained um, in another way that, that you can maybe say a little bit more about. Sure. So although I think my job is mostly to emphasize the differences because they tend to be overlooked, it's true there are important phenomenological continuities between the two states. 
And there are two sources of those. And in fact, they're the same two sources of the differences. So one source is conjuring, because although conjuring is not presenting and is deeply different from it, in a way, I think it, it is the most, it's different from it in a way that is the deepest cut in the life of the mind, the difference between representing and being constituted by how other things are. That's a very deep cut, but it's possible for there to be a bridge across it nonetheless. So conjuring is something like representing in a sensory way. And I can't say a great deal about what that amounts to, but it amounts to the thought that it represents these things in something like the way they're presented in the perceptual case. So here actually I'm, I'm tempted just to lean on some work by Dom Gregory, since Sheffield is in the air, and say I agree with him that imaginings are sensory representations in the sense he carved out. That's to say they pick things out by the way it's like to experience them. That is true of the conjuring. So that gives you one important continuity. The other continuity comes from the other major factor in my theory, the deployment of sensory knowledge, because it is sensory knowledge. And that's not just a label for it. Think about what this knowledge does in the case of perception. When you are presented with the facet that you see to be the face of a cube, it doesn't look to you just the same as it would if you were neutral about what this thing is. Your experience is transformed. This facet now looks like it's the front of a cube, not the front of a trapezium or anything mm. else it might be. So there's a shift in phenomenology and that shift is driven by you're applying the sensory knowledge I'm talking about. And just the same shift occurs in the case of imagining. It's operating on a very different input, on a conjured facet, not one that is presented to you, but the shift is much the same. Instead of simply visualizing a facet, you now visualize a cube. And there is a real shift in phenomenology there that is strictly analogous to the shift in the perceptual case. Good. Do you want to see a little bit more or did I interrupt you? I hope. No, okay. that's fine. No, okay, I think good. I've shot my bolt on that one. <laughs> Great. Um, so I was wondering next, um, if you could tell us a little bit more about what this entails for how we can gain knowledge by imagining. So you say that the relationship is actually a little bit different. We are um, using knowledge when we imagine uh, in a sense. Um, so can we uh, gain knowledge by imagining in your view? Should we be optimistic or pessimistic about imagination's uh, suitability to uh, give us knowledge in a way that's similar to perception? Well, here I want to begin to break ranks with the tradition I've signed up to. So Sartre, Ryle, Wittgenstein, and all those people were very skeptical about imagining's ability to yield knowledge of the world. And they were so because at root they thought, well, um, there's no room for gaining knowledge of what one's imagined. They thought that imagining is self-intimating. If you imagine a content, then you're aware of that content. Now, I want to accept that last claim, but I don't want to accept that as a result, you can't use imagining to learn about the world. So I don't know if I'm exactly um, one of the biggest proponents of the thought that imagining can teach us about the world, but I think it's important to concede that sometimes it can and to understand how it does, when it does. And when one's got clear about that, one will be in a better position to see just how often it can do it, I think. So yes, I'm optimistic in your terms. Okay. Great. That's, that's, that I think would be very good news to a lot of people <laughs> watching the video. Um, so um, in the chapter I read, you um, drew a distinction between three different models uh, of how imagination might give us knowledge. Um, and you're quite critical of these models in many, in many ways. You present objections to them and, and um, they serve, I think, to introduce a little bit how people have previously taught about about how imagination might give us knowledge. Could you tell us more about um, those three different models um, and, and why, it's, why each of them might seem plausible? Sure. So there are three models. And essentially, I, I endorse one of them and reject the other two, just to mm -hmm. putting it very crudely. Because the model I endorse is, surprise, surprise, the model that is uh, on which you can see how the theory of imagining I'm offering could yield knowledge of the world. So it's, there's a route from my theory through to knowledge of the world, 
contrary to the tradition to which I'm signing up, uh, that goes through this model. The other models don't allow that. So my, my dialectical task is to try and persuade you that of these three models, uh, only one of them ever applies, basically. Mm -hmm. So here are the three models. Uh, the first model we could introduce as an example. Suppose I ask you to uh, tell me how many sides there are on a, uh, a pyramid that has four sides as its base. How many sides are there in all? So one way to answer that question is to imagine the pyramid and then to count them. And that naturally suggests the following model of learning from imagining. So we're learning something about pyramids here, four-sided pyramids with four-sided bases. We're learning something about them, about the world, therefore, the world of geometry, as it may be. Uh, how are we doing so? Well, the, that example naturally suggests the following, which I call the scrutiny model. You imagine the thing, the thing you were supposed to, and then by attending to it or scrutinizing it, or in this case, counting, you find out something about the thing you've imagined. So that's the first model. Here's a different model, different example. Wittgenstein said there are no brown lights. Is Wittgenstein right? Actually, if you've seen the Empire State Building, which has an extremely fancy lighting system, it turns out he's wrong, but never mind that. Just suppose you try and settle it for yourself. The one way you might do it is, of course, famously, by just trying to imagine a brown light. And you might think, well, if I succeed, there is, can be such a thing, and if I fail, quite possibly there can't be. Now, never mind about whether this is a good way to answer Wittgenstein's question. Never mind the many worries people have had about whether imagining is a good guide to modal in general. It suggests a completely different model for learning about the world, in this case, the modal world, through imagining. Because the thought is not that you imagine something and then inspect it to see if it's a brown light. The thought is surely you just have a go at imagining a brown light. If you succeed, you know. If you fail, you know. But there's no gap between you, what you imagine and your awareness of what you're imagining. So that's a completely different model of learning about the world. You learn about the world by trying to learn according to certain specifications. But you know what you've imagined, whether you've succeeded or not, straight away. Knowledge of imagining comes for free, as we might put it. The third model, to get at that, just think of this example. You're making salad dressing. It's a tarragon dressing. Should you put honey in it? Mm, what to do? Well, you could add some, I mean, you shouldn't pretty clearly, but anyway, you could add some honey and see how bad it is, or you could add it in imagination and see in imagination what the effect is. And the natural way to think about this case is that you imagine the dressing with some honey in it, and then actually, not imaginatively, but actually respond with pleasure, displeasure, confusion, distaste, repulsion, whatever it may be, to the thing you've imagined. So that's a little bit like the scrutiny model, but only a little bit. So it's, it's not got, success or failure isn't quite written on the face of the imaginative project here, unlike the modal model. You've got to do something with what you've imagined, but you don't have to scrutinize it to see how it is. Rather, you take how it is and then actually respond to it affectively with pleasure or otherwise. So I call that the response model of imagining. Now, if you remember, my goal was to agree with Ryalix and co mm -hmm. that we have knowledge of our own imaginings uh, for sure. There's no gap between imagining and being aware of imagining, to speak a little bit more carefully. But nonetheless, we can learn about the world. And you can see how the modal model would allow me to have both those claims. If things work on the modal model, on the lines of the modal model, then we could see how. And of course, I'm not suggesting that such knowledge would be limited to modal features. We could learn about all sorts of things this way. We just try to imagine according to a certain specification and success or failure yields the knowledge we see. So I need to try and persuade people the modal model is the only game in town. It's not so important to me to exclude the response model, though I do think it goes with that general orthodoxy of assimilating, imagining to perceiving. And so I would like mm -hmm. to reject it, but I must, resist the scrutiny model. And so in the chapter you read, that is mostly what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yes, one thing I really liked is that you, you really um, criticize or at least offer potential objections to all of these models, including to the model that, that you favor um, yourself. One, one um, point that uh, your investigate um, involves looking at examples that seem to suggest that there um, 
in fact can be such a thing as what you call uh, unconscious imaginings, which is a shortcut for something more precise. Uh, so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, a claim that's relevant to that that you make. Um, so you, you say uh, that there is nothing uh, we imagine that eludes primitive awareness um, in, and nothing in primitive awareness that eludes belief uh, at some point in the chapter. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about, about that? What, what would it, um, why would people think maybe that there is such a thing as um, unconscious imagining or um, imaginings of which um, we lack awareness? Why is the scrutiny model um, seemingly so plausible to some? Well, that's a good question. In a way, you'd have to ask them, I think. But um, here's what they're right about. It is possible to imagine things being a certain way and not to believe that that's how you've imagined them. So that's what's going on in the pyramid case, I think. The pyramid case is plausible because you can indeed imagine an eight-sided figure, but that is the right answer, I believe, uh, without yet believing that the figure you've imagined has eight sides. And when you count them, whatever that amounts to, you come to that belief for the first time. So you're learning about the pyramid, the real geometrical figure, by learning about the thing you've imagined, which is indeed an instance of that figure. But that you can acquire belief does not show that you can acquire, does not show that there was no awareness you had beforehand of features of the pyramid. Uh, so in general, belief, be it perceptual belief or belief driven by imagining, is grounded in some other kind of awareness. It doesn't just pop into your head from nothing. You form beliefs on the basis of what we might very loosely call experience. This is obvious in the perceptual case. And if that's true there, you'd expect it to be the case in the realm of imagining too. So before you can count the pyramid sides, you must be aware of them in some more primitive way. And so the question arises, accepting that you didn't all along believe there were eight, were you nonetheless all along in that more primitive way aware of the eight? And to that question, I want to answer yes, you were. And so for every other aspect of every imagined content. In this primitive way, if you imagined it, you were conscious of it in this primitive way. That's the thought. Mm -hmm. Now, the pyramid case is slightly confusing in this respect because um, you can believe there are eight sides and you could be primitively aware of each of the eight sides but it's not very clear what it would be to be primitively aware of the sides as eight in number, if not believing they're eight in number. Think of just seeing a pyramid, right? You can see each of the sides, you could count that there are eight, but can you see the eight as eight? I just, I don't know what to say about that. So mm. we may have to change example here, but other examples will, will focus the, the case nicely. So uh, here's an example from Pinker and Finker and such people. If you imagine a D, a capital D, put it on its side and then put a capital J beneath it so that the upright of the J is in the middle of the D, what have you got? Answer? An umbrella. Um, well, <laughs> more accurately, a picture of an umbrella, right? Oh, yeah. yes, that's you right. Have not, you have not imagined a world in which letters could be used to keep off the rain. You've imagined a world in which letters can be arranged to form a picture of something that keeps off the rain, I think. Um, so look, there you might say, well, when I first joined the two, there was already an umbrella, a picture of an umbrella, but only a, maybe only a moment later, it took a moment for me to see, in inverted commas, i.e. become primitively aware that there was an umbrella. Now that is a good case for us to argue about. I'm gonna claim there was no moment at which you had imagined a picture of an umbrella where you weren't primitively aware that there was a picture of an umbrella, and the defender of the scrutiny model may say that's not right. There was such a moment. So I need to I need to describe this case in ways that may that seem plausible. I, I'm not saying what I've just laying it out doesn't do that. But that's that's the issue. So the claim, no unconscious imagining, is the claim that for any aspect of any content you imagine, you are primitively aware of that aspect of that content. Great. Um, I think I will end uh, the interview on, on this note because it, it gives a good um, impetus for people to actually go and read the chapter and the book when it comes out um, and find out more about what you make of the umbrella case, which, uh, which is quite a nice case. Um, so 
thank you so much, uh, Rob, for your time today and for doing this interview uh, with us. We're thank still you. experimenting with That's the format. Great. Thanks, Deb.